Last week, we uh, moved a little further into this understanding of moving and living in the unknown, and uh, we had some volunteers last week that kind of stood up and showed us that, that we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit seals us and calls us, and, and that is the starting point of our life. It is, it is where He has sealed us. Now, I want to go a little further today, as, like, as I said last week, we dealt with that and, and receiving that the Holy Spirit is our guide. He is guiding us through every situation, every circumstance. And so today I want to deal with it a little bit further. It, not only is the Holy Spirit our guide, but He is also in our lives, He is our gift giver. He is our gift giver. He is loaded with gifts. He is loaded enormously with gifts. There are almost 30-something gifts in the Holy Spirit, from administration, from different gifts that God has given you, that He pulls out of you, that He's used. But, but mainly, when we talk about the Holy Spirit and the gifts that He has given us, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts 1 and 8. I want to establish this because all of these gifts that we have are for one specific reason and one specific purpose. And this has to be the, the main thought in everything that we do. It's not the purpose of just getting gifts or having gifts, but it's what they're for. Uh, one of the things that I've, I've been blessed over my life is, is people have constantly comment, uh, commented on my life or com uh, gave me compliments and different things and said, you know, you're gifted. Well, that's good and, it, and it's bad. It, it's because 
giftedness, no matter what you're getting, whether you're an athlete, whether you're very good at business, no matter what you are, it comes with its advantages. It opens incredible doors, but it also comes with its disadvantages because you can fall in love with a gift. You can fall in love with what you do. You see athletes all the time that when they their their careers are over, and it's amazing with athletes because they, they've been playing since the time they're four and five years old, and now at 30 years old, they're multimillionaires, they're retired, and they're through. What do you do at 30 years old when the gift that you've had all those years is useless now? You find a lot of times they get into trouble, they lose all their money. They Why? Because what it was is they fell in love with their gift. And you watch them when they finally get cut in football and, and that one year and they finally cut them and it's like, but I still got something to give. I still, no, you're old. But I'm only 32 years old. You can't run as fast as that 22 year old can. You, you can't. And, it, and, and it's like, but, but I've got a whole life. Yeah, but that gift is done. And what happens in our lives is we get accustomed and comfortable with the gift that we have. And depending on what gift, it may last longer, it may last shorter. But the fact is, it's just a gift. And it's been given by the one who guides us to help us accomplish something. Listen to what Jesus says in Acts 1 and 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses or for me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So Jesus says, I'm, I'm sending back the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is coming, and we know that He is our guide. He is our teacher, but He's also something else. He says, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will empower you, and you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, He's not talking about just mental power. He's not saying that when He comes back, you're just all going to be super smart and you're just going to know everything and, and it's just going to zap you and you're going to... That's not what He's talking about. He's not talking about physical power. In, in the Old Testament, we saw some of that. We would see incredible abilities where the Holy Spirit would, would come upon Samson and others and, and they would do incredible feats. And Jesus says, you're going to receive power. You can imagine the disciples, they're like, yeah, like Samson or like this. And He says, no, no, no. This power is different. The power that's coming upon you is the same power that did all of that, but He's not coming back to accomplish that. He's coming back for this very purpose. He's coming back so that what? That you shall be my witnesses throughout the world. The whole purpose of the Holy Spirit on your life is that you would transform the world, that you would win the world to Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus says earlier that when He comes, He will talk about nothing but me. It's all about me. I am the King. I am the Savior. And He's going to lead people to me. That that was a big thing growing up. Because I, I had a, a struggle as I was growing in, in this relationship with the Holy Spirit because... I always had the difficulty of understanding that the Holy Spirit is in me, but at the same time, He will be on me. Notice what He says in that Acts 1 and 8, that when the Holy Spirit comes, He will do what? The power will come in you? No, He's going to come upon you. This is a different level and a different understanding of the Holy Spirit. Most of us in here understand that when we got saved, the Holy Spirit came in us. He came into us. He he became, as I said, our guide. He, he sealed us as we learned last week. All of that is wonderful. But there's another place where the Holy Spirit operates. And for me, I used to get so frustrated because, listen to me, the greatest feeling I have in the world is when I'm standing on this stage and the Spirit of God is on me. That is, there is nothing like it, is there? I mean, any of you ever just done something for God and then feel God on you? I mean, that, that's what you want. And, and what's so frustrating is, is that that high is so high, and then I can go to dinner here in a few hours and go eat with Elise, and it's like... It's like I go to feeling like nothing. And you're like, what happened? If I could, if I could bottle that and keep the Spirit of God on me all the time, and just feel like this all the time, it would be awesome. Right out, what I feel right now while I'm preaching, man, there's energy, and, and, and it's just like, oh, if I could just keep this and bottle this and use it. And God says, no, no, I'm doing this right at this moment for a reason. I am coming upon you right now, Tim, because your goal is to lead people to me. 
Your goal is to win souls. So there's going to be moments when I come upon you. But listen, I am always in you. I am always teaching and guiding you. I'm just not always upon you. And in your Christian walk, this becomes a struggle. So what we normally do is, we just get accustomed to Him being in us, and that becomes our only relationship. We kind of steer away from Him being upon us, because it does become a yo-yo. It does feel like Superman for a moment, and then, and for some people, that's frustrating. It can, be, it can be very frustrating to have to deal with the balance of that, but while at the same time realizing He's always in me. Go with me in your Bibles to John 20 and verse 22. Let me show it to you. Jesus has died, been resurrected. He's returned back to His disciples, and this is one of the last things He does to His disciples. Here's what He says. And when He had said this, He breathed on them, after he had said what he wanted to say, he breathed on them and said, Receive you the Spirit. Most theologians believe that at this moment is where the disciples received their salvation. See, unto this moment, Jesus had never done a sacrifice with them. Jesus had never, uh, we have no recordings of him, him, him doing an altar and saying, Peter, today I'm making a sacrifice for your sins and we're going to kill a ga- calf and we're going to, no, no, he doesn't do it. He was the sacrifice and he was waiting until his resurrection. But after his resurrection, he was able to look at his disciples and look at them and say, receive you the Spirit. Well, if they receive the Spirit, then that's good. They're good. Then he says after that, now go to Jerusalem and wait. Because why? Because the Spirit then is going to come upon you. It's the Spirit that saves you that, that receives you. It's the Spirit that does this, that, that allows you. So think of it this way. When you came to Jesus, you're standing there, and Jesus looks down from heaven and says, receive the Spirit. And what happens is your sins are washed away. The Spirit comes in. Anybody like that moment? Yeah, that was a great moment. But then he says also, now I want you to go get ready because the Spirit is going to come upon you. It's going to happen. So so understanding this, Him being in me, and at the same time there are moments He comes upon me, is a powerful understanding. And it's one that you need. It's one that most churches don't, don't work in. And because of this, you have saved people who come, but you never see any great outpouring. You never see miracles. You never see things happen. You never see why. Because we're comfortable with God being in us, but we're not comfortable with Him working through us. Let me put it to you this way. He comes in to save you. He comes on you to use you. So when I'm standing back there every Sunday, I realize, God, I know you're in me. I know that I can walk out of here, live in a cabin somewhere, and be saved, and be just as happy as I could be. It'd just be me and you, God. It is a wonderful life, and I don't have to be responsible for nobody. And then I'm standing there, and I'm like, Now, God, I need you to come upon me. Because in a few minutes, I've got to do what I can't do in myself. I need you to bring back to remembrance. I need you to do all the stuff. That's why you get scared. Let, let, let's say let's say I asked you to come up on the stage and speak. Or I asked you to come up on the stage and do something. You'd be like, I can't do that. And you're right. You can't do it. Now, it's not, not meaning if I just told you to come up here and tell everybody, tell everybody you're saved. I'm saved. Okay, thank you. Go sit down. You wouldn't have a problem with that. The problem is, is that you've got to get used to Him coming upon you. Well, I don't know what to say. I don't know what. Well, we're going to study, and we're going to do all the stuff we're supposed to do, and we're going to write notes. But here's the thing. The Spirit of God has got to come upon you. The disciples faced the same thing. They, they looked at Jesus, and they were like, we, we're, we're fishermen. We can't. And Jesus says, listen, you're going to stand before magistrates. You're going to stand before kings. You're going to, st- you're going to be in front of He said, but don't worry about it. Why? He said, because when you open your mouth, the Spirit will give you what you need to say. The Spirit will give you what you need to say. He doesn't just guide us. He doesn't just teach us. He also comes upon us. 
and uses us for an incredible... Go with me to Matthew, uh, Hebrews 6, 1-3. through 3. Let me show it to you here. The Apostle Paul and the others preached this, and, and, and like I said, we get away from it, but here's what, here's what the theology would be. Therefore, listen to what Paul says, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. So what I've just shared with you, him coming in you, are the elementary principles of Christ, that you, you are saved by faith, you believe and you get saved, that's the elementary. So if you're talking to somebody in church, you want to ask them, did you graduate kindergarten? Did you get out of elementary school? Yeah? Well, good. Then you understand salvation. You understand that if I confess my sins, He is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins. That is the elementary understanding. It has to be... You can't move to middle school, high school, but you've got to first pass elementary. And He says, these are the elementary principles of Christ. Let us go on to perfection. See? Now, here's the thing. People that... You're going to hear this. People who only deal with the elementary things, their first statement, you'll know that they're they're kind of off is they will talk, well, nobody's perfect. You ever, you ever meet somebody, a little kid in elementary, and then they, they bump into some big high school kid, and they're like, and, and, and they're looking at them, and, and, and you're like, one day you're going to be like that. I ain't never going to be like that. I, I, one, day, one day you're going to be strong like that. I hope so. Why? Because as an elementary it's hard for you to comprehend, I'm one day going to be this person, right? So Paul says, you got to move past the elementary mindset, otherwise you will always say, I'm always going to have this struggle. I'm always going to have this issue. I'm always going to battle this. I'm a no, no, no. No, you're not. You are in elementary when all you're dealing with is, I'm saved. That's all God ever did for me. He saved me. But when you finally get into middle school and high school, you start to understand, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. If he's greater, then what else could be strong? If he's greater than anything that will come against you, the only way you can ever lose is if you choose to lose. It's not like, well, he's greater sometimes. No, he's always greater. He's greater. And not only is he greater, but he's doing more. So listen to what he says. Let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. He said, let's not just stay stuck right there. Let's not have to repent over everything over and over and over for the next 30 years. This isn't me teaching, that's, that's the apostle. He says, let's, let's not get stuck in this mode of having to say, you know, I've just got an issue like this. Let us move onward. To what? Of the doctrine of, of baptism, right? The doctrine of baptisms. Did you catch that? It's not baptism. He says, you want to move on from the elementary? You've got to get into the doctrine of baptisms. You've got to understand that there are baptisms. There are three main baptisms that you're going to have to go through. The disciples taught this. This was normal teaching in their time, understanding the baptisms. That's why we taught last week that Paul asked them, that the disciples that were in Ephesus, he said, have you received the Spirit since you believe? We haven't heard. He said, well, then what doctrine have you heard? What, what is the wrong? What is wrong with you? You, you? It's because they weren't taught the baptisms. And because they weren't taught baptisms, they were short on what they were supposed to be in their life. Not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to teach you a doc, I'm just telling you the Bible. And here's what it says. Of laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. He says when you start to move into baptisms, you're, you're talking, your education, what you talk about is different. When you start talking at another level, you're going to start talking, hey, let's go lay hands on somebody and watch. I mean, you can't, sure we can't. Let, let's let's move on to doctrines of, of 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 eternal life. Let's talk about heaven. Let's talk about where we're going. Let's talk about. And he says, verse three, and this we will do if God permits. If God allows us to get to you, we will teach you about these things. So there's three baptisms that are mentioned throughout the Bible that that are that are understood. In fact, it's from the Old Testament. And the new. Next, next series I ever do on the, on the baptism or the Holy Spirit, I'm going to teach it from the Old Testament. So, so in next year or so when I do this, I'm going to teach it from the Old Testament. But let me give you just a, a headliner of this because the tabernacle itself was built 
as an understanding of the Holy Spirit. The, the tabernacle that Moses built, if, if we go back to where he's on the mountain of the Ten Commandments, we could teach it another way. But, but right here inside the tabernacle, listen, inside the tabernacle, first there is the baptism of salvation. Then there is the baptism of water. Then there is the baptism of the Spirit. Let me walk through them and show them. All right, first the baptism of salvation. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. For by one Spirit you were all baptized into the, the body. By one Spirit you were baptized, in, whether you were Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, all have been made to drink into one one spirit. This is your salvation. This is why since we messed this up, we have racial issues, we have all types of, uh, of, of educational issues, of, of class issues. It's why we have it. Because if we don't understand the basic principle of the first baptism that you receive, you're going to have problems. And here's what Paul says. He said, listen, this salvation that you have received, the very first baptism, brought you out of everything that you was and has put you into a whole new family, has put you into a whole new life. Listen how he says it. For by one Spirit, you were all baptized into one body. That means you are all my brothers, my sisters. You are all my family. There is no color thing. There is no race thing. There is no geology thing. There is no size thing. There is no education thing. We are all part of the same family. It's, 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 the, it's the simple understanding. of. And because you mess up salvation and you don't get it right, then you start having all the problems that you start having. Because salvation says this one Spirit, by the Spirit of God, you have been brought in and made one together. Now let me show it to you in, in, in this understanding. Is that salvation then is given to you by the Spirit. Salvation then is given to you by the Spirit. Let's go to the tabernacle. I said I want to show it to you in the tabernacle. There are three courts in the tabernacle. There is the outer court. There is the inner court. There is the Holy of Holies. They're just breaking it down. We'll do better later. But in the outer court, you could not come any further until you had brought your sacrifice and until they had on the brazen altar given up and burnt your sacrifice for the remission of your sins. It didn't matter who you were, no matter where you came from, didn't matter what your past was, you couldn't go any further until you had given your salvation, had allowed God to forgive you of your sins. So in the tabernacle, the very first step is blood. We are all blood kin. Because I have the blood of Jesus, and you have the blood of Jesus. Every one of us in this room that believes in Jesus Christ, we are part of the same family. And until you have died at that brazen altar, you cannot move any further in your walk with God. It's just the way it is. I didn't make it. I didn't design it. God did. Take it up with Him. That's why there is neither Greek, nor Jew, nor male, nor female, nor anything. From this moment on, we're all part of the same family. That's why, even though I love my wife, I love my wife, and we have a wonderful life together, and we have all this. Do you know one day when we get to heaven, we will not be married? We will be brothers and... Why? Because that in the spiritual world, that's what we are. We will be brothers and sisters, heirs and joint heirs, part of the same family. I know I just messed some of y'all's lives up. I was looking forward to walking around with my wife and holding hands. It's not about you. It makes people feel real good and make them come to church. You know. I used to hear that song, just wait by the eastern gate till I get there. And I'm thinking, I ain't waiting by no eastern gate, waiting for nobody. When I get there, I'm gone. At least when you get there, catch up. But I'm telling you, if I'm there before you, I'm not going to stand in heaven. I'm just waiting on the least. I'm not doing that. I'm going to go see Jesus. I'm going to go walking around. I'm going to enjoy it. Why? Because I made it home. 
If I pass you by the eastern gate, I'll give you a thumbs up. I'm just waiting on mama. Keep waiting. Because I'm home. I, I, I'm not under that same... Don't get me wrong. I love our lives. I love this, this journey. And I'm glad God gave me someone to journey this world with. But in my spiritual sense, you have to understand salvation. You've got to step out of your flesh and understand that salvation made us all brothers and sisters. All equal. There is no race. There is no... And, and because we keep trying to put that into our Christian world, we keep fouling it up. Because it's not biblical. So salvation then comes through, as we said in 1 Corinthians 12. Now, the second baptism is water baptism. Go with me in your Bibles to Matthew 28 and 19. Matthew 28 and 19. Here's what it says. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nation, baptizing them, this is the next baptism, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He said the second baptism that you have to go through is that of water. Now listen to me. The Spirit does the first baptism, right? You can't come to Jesus unless the Spirit draws you. Nobody gets saved unless you are drawn by the Spirit. So the Spirit baptizes you into the family. Well, who baptizes you in water? A disciple. Hmm, let me, let me say this. This is, this is, and, and I'm going to say this to my, my people as much as I'm saying this to anybody. Listen to me very carefully. If you are fortunate enough to lead someone to Jesus, then you had better be mature enough to disciple them. I am heavy on my staff right now because the thing we don't want to do is we don't want to be committed to people. Well, I, I just got a program here. With, no, no. You better get up in their life. You better be all up in their bed. If you had enough gumption to baptize them, then you had better have enough gumption to disciple them. Because listen to me, discipling is not Jesus' job, and discipling is not the Spirit's job. It's your job. And the reason we have so much fouled up church in so many fouled up ways is because we get people dunked in water, put them down as a number, and we think, well, we, we, we did good. No, you didn't. You just got started. A lot of you in this room, that happened to you. You got dunked, baptized in some pond or creek, and somebody just told you, we'll see you in church next Sunday, and it messed you up for years. Why? Because somebody has to come into your life and disciple you. That's what the Bible says. Jesus says, go therefore and make... Who is he telling that to? The people. He says, and for you and for all the... Name. Baptize. Who's going to baptize them? You are baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're signifying what's already been done. The Spirit has brought them into the family. They're part of the family. But now you've got to disciple them and teach them and show them how I walk, how I act, how I live. And if you can't do it, then you better not be getting in some pond with somebody and getting in a creek with somebody and thinking you're going to baptize somebody and count it as a number. You better have some big boy pants on because you're fixing to be responsible for that soul. You are responsible for that individual because that's your mandate. You baptize them, you disciple them. Mm. In the understanding of this, in the temple, when you move past the brazen altar, is that okay? I had to get that off me. That God just came on me real hard. In the, in the altar, we understand that after you pass the brazen altar, you move to the laver. The laver is water in a bowl, and you wash until you're clean. It signifies that everything... The brazen altar required elements, required... The laver requires effort. It requires work. It's your work. Now at the brass and altar, you just stand there and watch the, you know, ooh, man, burning that calf. But at the laver, that's why in the New Testament it says, come out from among them. Make yourself clean. It's not talking about your salvation. He's talking about your discipling. 
There's things in your life that you yourself, if you have, have a problem with that issue, you can flush it down the commode. You can turn off your phone. You can fix it. Quit, quit, quit sitting there. And I've been there. I've talked about some of the issues in my past, and I was just like that. Like, God, just deliver me. God, deliver me. And God's like, burn it. If you quit, quit hiding it in your room, and you'll quit hiding it in your car, you'll quit doing this, you'll quit going there. If, if you quit going to the bar, then you would have to pray, God, don't let me get drunk tonight. You, you'll be okay. You gotta wash yourself in some areas. You got to fix that. Number three, then there's the baptism of the Spirit. Go to Matthew 3 and 11. Matthew 3 and 11. I indeed, here's what John says, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. That's why later, the disciples of John, because what was John doing? John had the first two. You were baptized with repentance. And John was teaching how to live. And John was discipling his disciples how to live. But, he says, I'm limited. There's a baptism I can't give you. There's a baptism that I would love to give you, but only one can do it. And he says, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than me, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, and fire. He said there's a baptism that you don't know. In, in the tabernacle, it would be the oil. The oil that's put upon the, in the ram's horn. And we describe the Holy Spirit many times as oil. It, it's, it's the oil that comes from the altar that's poured on you. It's the oil that comes upon you. Remember the oil that ran on Aaron's beard? The oil that represents the presence of God, the power of God being upon you, being on you. That's why many times in church services we take oil and we pour it on people or we touch their head with it. We, why? Because it represents. In fact, the New Testament says when you pray with somebody, take oil, anoint them with oil. Why? Because it represents that not only are we saved, saved, but the presence of God, the power of God is fixing to man manifest itself right here. We are speaking the manifestation of not only the Holy Spirit, but fire that is fixing to transform your life. Fire that's fixing to turn your life around. John said, I long for this baptism. But he wasn't allowed to receive it. It wasn't time. This baptism is done by Jesus. This baptism is done by Jesus. You can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit wherever you are. I know we try to set the stage where it makes it easier. Pastors lay hands on people. We touch people. That's wonderful. But I've had just as many receive the Holy Spirit when I could sit them right in chairs and line them up, tell them what's fixing to happen, walk by, and just touch them. And right there sitting in a chair, they just start speaking in tongues and receive them. Oh, I've never heard of them. No music? No. No. Didn't need any of it. Why? Because you can't baptize nobody in the Holy Spirit. That is Jesus' baptism that He gives unto His people. And you can receive it. I've, I've, I've seen people receive it in a kitchen while they were making biscuit dough. Dough go one way, they go the other. Just sitting in their kitchen praying and seeking. I've heard people receiving it driving down the road in their car. If, if you if you watch Robert Morris and you like uh, Gateway Church and I'm a, I'm a big Robert Morris fan I like him in a lot of ways and, and so he, you know how he received it sleeping he tells the testimony he says I, I was just wanting the Holy Spirit so bad I had people laying hands I was praying oh I'm gonna see the Holy Spirit I'm gonna see and he says my wife one night just kept waking me up just bumping me like be quiet and he woke up and he's like. What are you bumping? What are you making me? She said, you're just sitting there praying in tongues. He says, I am. Because it's not your gift. It's God's gift. But He's giving it to you, as we said, to win souls. It's an empowerment gift. Baptism in water, that's for you. Repentance, that's for you. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit... As Acts 1 and 8 says, that's so that you can win the world. 
That's so you can transform a world. So that you can make a difference. So go with me to Acts 2, 38 and 39. Is this making sense? Is this okay? Acts 2, verses 38 and 39, here's what it says. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. That's the what? First baptism. Repent, and they be baptized. Listen, and then you shall receive the gift of the... Listen. For the promise is to you and your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord God will. That is the process. Peter had it understood. He says, every one of you need to repent. Every one of you need to be baptized in water. And then you can receive the gift from Jesus Christ. You can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he says, who's this for? Everybody God's calling. Every one of you in this room this morning. Every person who says, I have a call. I just feel the prayer. God has saved me. God, If God saved you, if you got water baptized, then God also intended for you to be empowered. To be part of the body of Christ that transforms the world. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 12 and 1. 1 Corinthians 12 and 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. I, I don't want you to, to misunderstand. I don't want you to, to wonder. So we know why they're there, but let's discuss them. Go to ch- verse 4 through 11 and let's read. Verse 4 through 11 and let's read. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. So understanding that every one of us in this room, we are called to be saved, we're called to be baptized, we're called to be filled with the Spirit. Now let's understand that these gifts that we receive are diversified. They're not for you. Since they're not for you, you can't just kind of like say, well, I like this one or don't. And that's what we try to do, but that's, that's the wrong process. Here's what he says. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are differences uh, or uh, diversities of activities, but the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of... Why is it? Why is the Spirit of God going to come on you? Why is the Spirit of God going to use you? So that it can profit all. Why, why does God say, Tim, you've got to come on this stage? Because I need you to profit all. Don't worry, it's not your gift, it's my gift. And I'm going to bring it on you, and I'm going to anoint you, and I'm going to... T- now, I have the Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I love the Holy Spirit, I'm guided by the Holy Spirit, He teaches me every day. But there are moments, He says, I'm fixing to come on you. There are moments I go into hospitals, I'm fixing to come on you. There are moments I'm fixing to deal with somebody that says, Pastor Lot, I need to have a session with you, we need to talk. And, and, and you think, well, Pastor Lot's smart. No, 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 Pastor Lot, before you get there, is standing in his room, and he, in his office, and he's saying, Lord... I don't know what to say. I don't know how to say it. I don't know what to do. I need you to come on me. I need you to come on me in a special way. Give me understanding. Give me. Let me show you as, as we walk through. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the what? Same Spirit. To another, faith by the... Just go ahead and say that to yourself. Same Spirit. Same Spirit. That's just what he's going to... He keeps saying this because he wants you to understand it all functions together as one body. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another uh, different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing... So, so you don't have it all the time, do you? It's not yours. It's not, it's not, it's not your normal life. So distributing to each one individually, so everybody in here may get something different from time to time, as he wills. Let me show it to you as we break it down. Let me pull up my first slide if you will, or give it to them this way. Let me break it down to you in an easier way to understand. 
Of these nine gifts, I can break them down into three different categories. I can break them down into three different ways in which we do it. In fact, you want, you want to know where denominations come from and all this stuff that, that, that we have in our world? It's because of these gifts right here. And it's because we're wrestling all the time with whether or not we want God to use us in these gifts. So let's, let's look at them. Number one, we call them first revelation gifts. You have them right there. Revelation gifts operate in the ears. Revelation gifts operate in the ears. So when I talk about revelation gifts, it's a word of knowledge. It is a word of wisdom. It is a discerning of spirits. So there's some groups, there's some denominations, there's some people that say, we like these. Anybody like good Bible teachers? I mean, you love Bible memorization, you love everything about... I mean, you grew up in, in, in a good denominational church where it was a lot about the Bible. I mean, it's it's like, man, we memorized the Bible, we quoted, we have Bible drills, we have all this stuff, we... we we have good teachers. I mean, I mean, basically, there's some people you can turn on TV and basically you don't know if they're preaching or teaching a Bible study. You don't know because that's their, that's their mode of operation. And people are like, man, I love just sitting here and just listening. I love just taking notes and I love growing and I love, I mean, that's, I mean, that's what I'm just drawn to. And, and, and that's why people ask you, what kind of church y'all got? Cause, cause they have in their mind a kind of church that they're looking for. And what most people are looking for, and especially in the South where we grew up in, in our denominations, we like good Bible teaching. Well, it's the Spirit that comes upon people to teach them the Word, to reveal the Word. So when your Sunday school teacher is speaking and God gives them revelation, that's the Holy Spirit. When, when, when you've got a, a teacher, a preacher who's preaching and God gives them revelation through the week and they're writing out their sermons and doing all this, this is wonderful. But this is all done by the Spirit, to teach, to instruct. And you get this through the ears. You get this through the ears. You receive this through the ears. Some of what I'm doing this morning is teaching. And so through your ears, you're receiving revelation. The second which of these is a second gift. So you have the revelation gifts which come through our ears, and then second three are simply the power gifts. Now this gets a little more freaky. Look at the person beside you and say, it gets a little more freaky. It does. Some people are like, mm, I don't like that. We just stick with by learning about Jesus. We're going to just do the Bible studies. We, we, don't, we don't want any, no, no. We don't want none of this laying on the hands. We don't, we don't want any of this. We don't believe in that. Well, it's kind of hard because if you're going to deal with the same spirit, he has all of these gifts in his repertoire. It's you who is saying that we don't want that. And then we can't figure out why we got such problems in our church because some of your people need some prayer. They need somebody to lay hands on them. Because the devil already has laid his hands on them and yet God needs to get his hands on them and there needs to be prayer. So there are power gifts. Listen to what it says. There is the gift of faith. There are some people that just, you just like, like as you're talking about an issue and talking about a problem and, and all of a sudden we may be saying here today, and, uh, hey, so and so has cancer and we need to be in prayer about this. And, and everybody's like, yeah, we need to be in prayer. But somebody in here, God begins to deal with. A, a Holy Spirit begins to come on. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know what? I just, I just believe they're going to be healed. Brother Lot, I just believe they're going to, will you agree with me? They're going to be. And I'm like, oh yeah, I do, I'm with you. Why? Because what I'm sensing is, when I'm around that person, is the gift of faith. They, they heard the same message that I told you, but they received something from the Spirit differently. You ever around people like that? You get you put something on Facebook, so-and-so needs prayer, and you're going to get, oh, we're praying, oh, holding them up. Oh, And then you get somebody that just comes out of the, out of the clear blue, and they're like, I'm just believing that everything's going to be all right. I'm just declaring that that thing is going to come out. I'm declaring that the next x-ray is going to be good, and you don't know what to do with it. You're just like, okay, thumbs up. That's a weird person. Because the first thought in your mind, what if it don't happen? What if they said that and it don't? Because you can't do it within yourself. It has to be a gift of the... There are times in my life where I use wisdom gifts. There's time in my life I use knowledge gifts. There's time, And then there's times where God says, Tim, fix the heal of that person. 
And I, and I, I walk in, and I'm like, look, God, God's fixing to do something in your life. And they'll start crying. I believe that. I'm telling you. I know God's already sensed it. I need you to agree with me. Something. What is that? That's a gift of faith that God has given through the Holy Spirit. To do what? To transform a world. The gift of healing. The working of miracles. All of these are power gifts that come from the Holy Spirit. Just like they, just like all the others, they come from the Holy Spirit. There's another three. The next three are called the uh, spoken gifts. Because these operate through the... All right. When, when we talk about our word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, that's through my ears. When I talk about gift of faith, gift of healing, working of miracles, that's through my hands. When I talk about prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, that's through my mouth. All three areas of your life. Your ears, your mouth, your hands. That's how the Holy Spirit operates. So, the spoken are these. Prophecy. Somebody starts prophesying. It's, 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 I declare that this is going to happen. God, God gives them a vision and an opening because oh, one of the, one of the promises from the Holy Spirit and from Jesus is, is that when the Spirit comes, He will show you things to come. There are going to be times the Holy Spirit's going to reveal to you, I know where I'm supposed to be. I know where I'm supposed to go. When the Holy Spirit does that in my life, it's usually a five-year process. I always talk about my five-year projects. God comes to me. He doesn't, I don't get prophecy every week. I, you know, I, I, I wish I'd, I, I really don't wish I did. I, I'd be freaked out if he just give it to me all the time. But I'm just like, just give me one. Let me get that one. And then give me an, and God's like, are you ready, Tim? I'm going to, I'm going to show you things, things that are to come. I'm going to show you pictures of things. I'm going, I'm going to give you dreams. Some people call them dreams that I get. You know, Pastor Lot just, he's always dreaming. No, no. Sometimes I understand when God is moving on, it's prophecy. I'm declaring it and I have to, Speak it. I have to declare it. Sometimes I'm the first person. I'm always usually the first person that has to declare it. But it's a prophecy that's been given into my life. It's, it's just like with you. It could be your family and God's giving you a word like your kids are going. And you got to speak that prophecy. You cannot let go of that prophecy. The second one is tongues. Unknown tongues. Speaking in tongues. Praying in tongues. Now the tongues he's talking about here is where tongues would have an interpretation. So we're not talking about just praying in your closet in tongues. We're not talking about a, a, a praying, because remember now, when we pray in tongues, it is to edify us. So, so here when we talk about the Holy Spirit doing something, we're saying that, no, no, he's here to edify everybody. So you may be in a service where somebody is praying in tongues, speaking in tongues. When they begin to speak in tongues, you may be sitting there and think, Wow, I know what the Spirit's saying. I know what the Spirit is saying. And it's a powerful point. Have you ever been in one of our services where the Spirit of God speaks and, and, and it gets, you don't have to tell people to get quiet. It's like, ooh. Somebody begins to pray in tongues, speak in tongues, and it's a different type of, type of message. And then as soon as they're through, you're just quiet. Why? Because you know somebody in that room understood what was being said. And then they will begin to say the interpretation of tongues. What the Spirit is trying to speak into lives at that moment. Think how awesome that is. The Spirit even has a way to speak audibly to the church. Instead of you walking around thinking, I don't know what we need to do. I don't know. Get into the Spirit. And the Spirit will audibly through tongues and interpretation, say, Thus saith the Lord, this is what I'm trying to do. This is what I want you to realize. This is what I want you to focus on. All of this is happening inside the presence of the Spirit. Now listen, by valuing the Holy Spirit, you value the gifts. The less you value the Holy Spirit, the less you value the gifts. So the battle of the church is is whether or not we will walk in the Spirit. Not just individually, 
But corporately, will we walk in the Spirit? Go with me to 1 Corinthians 14 and 1. 1 Corinthians 14 and 1. Pursue love. And do what? Desire spiritual gifts. But especially that you may prophesy. Because without vision, people perish. Listen, we can have a great church service. Listen to me. One of the keys to all seasons. If you want to know why you're here, it's because you're here to be part of a purpose. Because you can come to church, and I've been in great churches where, man, we had powerful services, no vision. Great Sunday moves of God, but all you did was wait till next Sunday. Nothing in between, nothing, nothing we were all supposed to be working toward, doing or dreaming toward, speaking about, talking about. And what happens is, is that you're just going to have these high moments and low and high and low. And that gets discouraging as much as it is never feeling God. It gets just as discouraging feeling God for an hour and then not feeling Him for five, six days and then feeling Him again and then not, and, and it's like, okay, I, it's, it's almost like cranking your car, but never putting it in gear. It's time to go out of the yard. Going out to the garage? Yeah, we're going to the garage today. Got that big 350 sitting in that Camaro out there. Man, we, we face to get after it. Are we? Oh, yeah. Come on. You hear it all around. We get in the garage. We crank it. Man, we hit that thing. And turn it off. Well, I'll see you next week. That's it? Right, it's only for us. We just crank it up just so we can hear it run. And if somebody new is in the garage, ooh, I like hearing that thing. I think I'm going to come back next week and hear it again. How do you think that's going to last? See, some of you, your problem in your life is, is that you just come to church every week to hear the car crank. But you don't have purpose. And without vision, you perish. You perish. But I'm a Christian, yeah. I'm saved, yeah. But you are to pursue first love and then spiritual gifts. And when you've got love and spiritual gifts, then the only thing left is, God, give me something to accomplish. Give me somewhere I'm supposed to be. Three things that you need to be focused on. Number one, Discover the spiritual gifts God has for you. Which ones up here are more comfortable for you? When I, when I was first growing up, understand, these are the only ones I ever saw in church. This was it. I, I didn't know hardly much of anything about those. We showed up to church. They were going to be praying. There was going to be prophesying. People wasn't pregnant, going to be told they're going to be pregnant. It was, it was all kind of stuff. It was. It was just, it was like, whew, man, we had church and we did. We, we, we maximized these three. Tongues, interpretation of tongues. Man, we were, we were getting after it. Over time, God began to say, I need to grow you and use more gifts. And when God would begin to say, Tim, I want to give you a word of knowledge. I'm like, mm, 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 mm. no, no, no. I ain't, I ain't talking in front of no people. I'm not, I don't, uh, 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 that's, that's not, a word of wisdom. Oh, Lord, no. Lord, please, no. I don't, I don't want to get into nobody's business or anything. I don't want to. Discerning of spirits. Oh, please, God. I, I can tell, but I do not want to have to look at somebody and say, look, you are messed up. I don't need this. I need to live a quiet, peaceful life. And over the years, guess what? If those that know me now know that this is my, my strength. It's like, I don't want to be on boards. I get elected to boards. Why? Because one thing about Tim, he's going to tell you. He, 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 he's not, he, he's not going to sugarcoat it. He's just going to tell you how it is. He's going to tell you exactly what it's supposed to be. He's just going to. Why? Because God, God said, Tim, I've got more gifts and, and I need to be able to put you in more rooms. And then he says, guess what? I need to be able to put you in more 
rooms. I need to put you in more places. I need when somebody is in town and they've got somebody sick, I need them to be able to say, we can call Pastor Lot because Pastor Lot will come over and Pastor Lot can pray. We, hey, we don't know what we need to do. Well, let's call Pastor Lot because Pastor Lot, he, he, he's, he's give us good advice. Hey, we, 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 we gotta have great church services. We, we want to have, yes, we're going to have powerful services and moves of God and we want to feel God. And yeah, we're going to have all that. And, and listen to me, it becomes work to allow the Holy Spirit and to develop all and every gift that God can reach. I always used to use it this way and I'll, I'll describe it the best I can. Having the Holy Spirit is like a doorway. That's all it is. I've always described it this way. When I received the Holy Spirit, I got the keys to the door. I got the keys to the door. I and the Spirit now can walk up to the door any time and unlock the door. I have to step out of my flesh and walk in the Spirit. And when I come into the Spirit, I can walk into the storehouse of God. When I do, depending on what situation or circumstance I'm in, the Holy Spirit can move on me to accomplish the goal. If, if, if I got somebody who's sitting here and says, Pastor Lot, I don't know about this job. I don't know about, I don't know what I need to do. And, and, well, let me go in the storehouse. And, and, and I come out and I say, whoo, let, lay hands on you and just like, Honda, 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 Honda. Feel better? Oh, I feel much better. You got any direction? No. But I feel better. Good. Then we come, no. When I go into the storehouse, I need the right gift for what I'm fixing to pull out. My wife helps me with this more than anything because she comes from a Methodist. She was Methodist all her life. And I, I'm come from that, that right there, prophecy, tongues. And, 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 and we blended those two, but what had to happen was she had to become better at the weird side. And I had to become better at the talking side. It was easy for me to pray for something, just lay hands on something, speak something. And there's moments in my life where this this would hit me. I was at a conference once, and when I was at that conference, I, I was sitting there in the spirit. And you have to know me; I don't I don't like when they say, "Oh, we want all the preachers to come up and pray for people." I, I'll usually just sit there. I don't I don't want I don't like that because to me, I don't know. It's not about just laying hands on a bunch of people. It, it, I, each person is individually got to receive something. That's why when I pray for people, you'll see me, it, it may take me an hour to walk down, because for one person, we may just pray power. For the next person, we need information. For the next, And I have to allow the Holy Spirit to move on me at those different times. I always wanted to be one of those guys that just walked along, whoa, walk, 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 walk. I don't know what anybody's got, but praise God, we all going to fill up. And I'm, I'm like, I'm like, that's good, I want that. And God says, that's not you. I'm like, this so I was at this conference and they, they told us just go pray with people and I was just walking around and I was like watching people. Man, they were laying hands on people, praying with people, people. And there's this one guy standing there and he, he was just he was just boy, they two or three come by and lay hands and you know how they you know, let it go, grab more, do this, jump, raise your hand, look. It was giving me everything. Man, he was getting to what far. And I was, and my attention kept drawing back to it. And I'm like, Well, he's bound to got whatever he's looking for by now. I said, They they done they done worked him over. And at the end, God said, go to him. And I said, well, I guess I'll go lay my hands on him. And, and God said, just ask him what's wrong. I walked up to him and I just, I said, hey, open your eyes. You know, he like, he, he done, he done. And he opened his eyes and, and I said, what is it you need? He said, I want to be saved. And it's like, just the same way I feel right now. It's like my heart just went boom. All that power in the room. All that power. But all of it pulling the wrong thing out of the storehouse. There are times when people's like, I need the Spirit. There are... But let me tell you what the Spirit does. He meets you for whatever your need is at that moment. Sometimes it is, I need, I need God to deliver me of something. Sometimes we do need that prayer. And then sometimes we need... I need an answer to something. Something is just, I need God to reveal through the Holy Spirit something in my life. And He operates in all of those, those gifts are all there so that we can be successful in winning souls. And I love them all. I don't want to lose any of them. I don't want to lose any of them. Go with me one last scripture to 1 Peter, and we'll read this scripture and I'm through. 
First Peter 4, 10, here's what it says. As each one has received a... Minister it to one as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Do you stand? If you're saved today, then you have the Holy Spirit in you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. What we call the receiving of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is special for this very reason. It allows God to move on you. And, and I don't know why God chose this way to be the way that He introduces it to us, but it is the way. Throughout the Bible, throughout the book of Acts, it is the way. It is, it is where we know we're saved. We know He lives in us. We are, we are a disciple. We, we are a learner of Jesus Christ. We are a learner. And we come and we say, Lord, I'm yours. I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit that you give. I want to operate in power outside of me. Not for selfish reasons, but so that I might win souls. That I can change lives. So Jesus, I ask You to fill me. And I ask You to come upon me. When you do that, what's going to happen is, is that the first place that God moves upon your life is through your tongue and mind. We call it speaking in tongues. You're not going to understand the words. It's not going to make sense to you. It's not meant to. Because it's not a physical thing. It's spiritual. And while you're praying in that unknown language, you won't know but one thing. It's making me strong. I, I don't understand it. I can't explain it. It's, it's the gift God gave. You can do it at your house. You can do it in the kitchen. You can do it walking down your hall. You can, you can do it. It's not, it's not limited to church. Prayer can happen anytime at any moment, but the level of it is up to you. It's God's gift. And when I pray in the Spirit, it opens the door. And I can't explain, but in that spiritual world, it opens the door and I can walk in. And if I need wisdom, he says, if you lack wisdom, ask, and I give it generally. He just says, that's yours. I need knowledge. I, brother, I've got a sister who's, who's, who's sick. I, I, need, I need to be able to lay hands and heal. God, give me the power to walk in that hospital. And whatever it is that you need, it's not limited to Pastor Lot. It's limited to whoever believes. You can receive whatever it is you need. That's why I pray that every person in this room has that baptism. Not so that you have somewhat the world crazy, but so that you could operate in every gift that God has for your life. So that people can be saved. Otherwise, God can only use you in the one and rare and few moments that that one gift you will let Him operate in operates. If all you do is, is, I just like teaching, I just like teaching, I just want to teach the Bible, then unless somebody just needs teaching, you're of no good. But if you have all of those gifts available, then whatever circumstance your family, whatever circumstance your life, whatever, you're ready. You're ready for the Spirit to be able to give you and to work through you and be upon you to change the situation. If you're in this room today and you say, Pastor, I need that. I need that. I'm going to pray, and, and those of you that are, that are good, or, 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 then you're dismissed. But I want to take time this morning for those that in their spiritual life, they need a breakthrough. Maybe it is the next baptism. Brother Lot, I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way. I'm, I'm a disciple. 
I've, I've had water baptism, but I know I need this. I need, I need, there's a level of working for the Lord that I can't do yet. There's a level that I don't have yet that I want. And it's been promised to me, and I want that. It's not that you've got to fight for it, work for it. You just have to receive it. And you may in this room say, Brother Lot, I'm going through things, and I, I need to walk into the storehouse this morning, and I need to receive from the Holy Spirit. That, that's what we're here for. That's the purpose. We did not come to crank up the car just to hear it roar a couple times and then turn it off. We came to put it in gear. We came to put it in drive and to see what it'll do. That's where the joy is. That's where the excitement is. And as I pray this prayer, you decide, are you good? If you are, great. If there's something you need, then this morning, that's what I'm here for. As your pastor, that's what I'm here for. To help you walk in that. Father, thank you for your presence. Right now, I feel your Holy Spirit so strongly on my, on my life. I feel His presence in this place so mightily. Lord, for every person that's good, that is received today and received this week, and I'm thankful that Holy Spirit, you are guiding and directing and you're leading them, and they're good. They are good. But Lord, for that person, those people right now that's in this room, that you brought them here, you led them here, and all through this service, you have been speaking to them, that's you. That's you. It's time for you and me to go further. It's time for you to receive more. It's time for you to step out of what is a comfortable gift and step into a mightier gift, to step into a different gift. Father, I speak right now that you will give them the boldness, the desire to want more, to desire to be more, for you to rest on them, and they're not ashamed that whatever you do, they're okay with. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.